All right, all right, all right. Worship was off the charts today, and I, I want to really thank the worship team as well as the media team because uh, there is a lot that goes into recording and to being able to share this worship with you week in and week out. So my heart goes out uh, to all of them in love and appreciation. And I hope that each of you this week were able to listen to the State of the Church Address that I gave uh, this week. If you've not seen that, you can go to the church Facebook page, and I talk about when we will eventually be able to meet again corporately, and it looks as though it could be several months uh, from now. I just want you to know that I miss uh, being with you in person, but I'm thankful for technology uh, that we can still be uh, together via the internet. I would love to have you, uh, encourage you to make sure you share uh, this message uh, on your social media and, and send out digital invites and week after week gather as many people as you can and get the word out about our church and the sermons and all that's going on here at Shepherd Church. We're in a series called The Sands of Time where we're looking back uh, over history, important times in history and uh, then looking towards the future and where are we headed. We don't want to forget what happened in the past uh, because we don't want to make some of the same mistakes that we've made in the past. We started off in the 1600s with the story of Rembrandt, and then we moved to the 1700s uh, when our country was founded. Last week, uh, we went to the 1800s. We looked at the Civil War and the Underground Railroad. And so today, I want to move us into the 1900s. Uh, specifically uh, taking you to the 1940s. I want to speak to you on the story, the history lesson today is on the story of Auschwitz, and I want you to take your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to them now and turn to Proverbs chapter 24. That's Proverbs chapter 24. This year, the year 2020, I know for a lot of you it's been a, one of the most difficult years of your life, but this year is the 75th anniversary of when the Soviet armies liberated Auschwitz, the, lar the largest and the deadliest uh, Nazi concentration camp that ever existed. Some call it a concentration camp. I actually call it uh, an extermination camp. I've got some pictures here I want to show you. This is a, uh, and I've, I've actually been there. Uh, this is over. Uh, in, in Poland, and uh, this is uh, an aerial view of what some of the housing uh, looked like. As you know, from 1933 to the year 1945, Hitler ruled uh, Germany. And I don't know if it's fair to call someone evil, but in my mind, uh, Hitler was evil personified. He had an army that uh, took control of Europe Part of their beliefs as the German people was that they were superior to all other people on the face of this earth. Hitler and the Nazi party were solely responsible for what's been known or called the Holocaust from 1941 to the year 1945. The, the, word, the, the word Holocaust, or let, let me give you the definition here, it's an ideological and systematic state-sponsored persecution, and mass murder of six million Jews. There were, there were also millions more that were killed, but six million of those that were killed were Jews. And the word Holocaust, the first part of that word in the Greek is the word whole, and cost in the Greek is the word burned. And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this Holocaust in Auschwitz, it took place in, uh, in a, a, a town outside of Krakow, or Krakow, uh, uh, Poland. And this is actually the property where Auschwitz took place. And there were thousands of concentration camps. Some people think there were five or six. There were literally thousands of concentration camps. But the worst, the worst was Auschwitz. And they came in on railroad tracks. They brought in, in railroad cars, Jewish people, 
but I, I know this is, this, they've got this set up where you can go over there and see what it was like, but they weren't cute little red railroad cars like that. These railroad cars were full of people, full of Jewish people, that the only reason they were brought in here was because they were Jewish. And there wasn't just a few of these boxcars. There were literally hundreds and thousands of them where Jewish people were sent 24 hours a day. These railroad, these cars, these railroad cars came in 24 hours a day. The first thing they would do is they would separate the men from the women. And you can see that they've moved all the men to that side. They've moved all the women to this side and they're kind of going down and, and separating. So when the Jewish people got to the concentration camp, they really, they really didn't know what was going on. They didn't know what was going to happen to them, but they separated them and pretty much at the very outset, the first thing they did, they separated them, then they stripped them, took all their clothes off of them, all of their belongings, and they marched them into a gas chamber that looked like a shower. They thought they were gonna get a shower because they'd been in that railroad car for so long. But instead of, instead of a shower, gas was let, was let into that ch chamber and they all died uh, by being executed by, by in the gas chamber. And then of course their bodies were taken and they were thrown into an incinerator. And I have, what I have is I have a, I, I got online and, and there's all kinds of uh, movies and videos that you can watch from that period. But I, I wanna show you a three minute video. And I'm, I'm gonna start preaching after this three minutes, but this video is a testimony of two uh, women who were actually in Auschwitz. They were there, and they, they witnessed all of this firsthand. Now, if you have small children, I want you to know that the pictures are not graphic in nature, but the description of what happened is somewhat graphic. And I, I, want, I want you to know that it's important that we never forget the atrocities that took place or occurred. After this three minute video, we're gonna turn to Proverbs chapter 24, so you can get that ready. And as you watch this video, I just want you to remember that the Jewish people are God's people. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, speaking of Israel, God said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And this, this event, the Holocaust, is a true story. It happened. It wasn't that long ago. I think it's important that we remember it. I want you to watch this video, and then I will come back and we'll start to preach. So watch this video if you would. Day and night, columns of women and children and elderly passed by our barrack. We watched them enter the gate that led to the gas chambers. Sometimes they called out questions to us, by that point, nothing could save them. The sounds were magnified when we worked at night. First, I would hear the hissing of the steam engine arriving at the platform and the whistle of the train. And then within a half hour, hundreds of women, children, and elderly would pass by our barrack and disappear into the entrance of the gas chambers. Those arriving at night saw the smoke and flames belching from the chimneys and even burning bodies in open pits. It looked to them that they were being herded into open flames. They prayed and cried and, and screamed and I would plug my ears with my fingers. Day and night the transports kept coming the five gas chambers and crematoriums operated day and night, killing as many as 10,000 people a day. Auschwitz was designed for one primary purpose, genocide. Blueprints of the facility show deliberate designs implemented to make large-scale gassing and cremation an efficient operation. The sheer number of murders that took place there on a single day was inconceivable, even for someone who witnessed the horror firsthand. I was at a window, I was looking, I saw them. They even called out questions to us. I saw these women, these beautiful little children, babies, sitting on the road waiting their turn, and I would 
you know, my eyes saw it, my brain didn't accept it, and my whole system didn't accept it. That's how you, that's how I think I coped. And in, not just in retrospect, but I know that I did not have the ability to absorb it. Although they were already losing the war, the Nazis seemed even more determined to murder as many Jews as possible. Irene and her family were among the more than 424,000 Hungarian Jews deported to Auschwitz in just eight weeks. The killing machine quickly reached capacity. The killing was backed up. Five crematoriums, gas chambers, worked day and night, but it still was backed up. And so these people are waiting their turn. They're at the gate and they have no idea what they're waiting for. And that is my mother. And these two little boys next to her are my two little brothers. And they have no idea, but they are waiting their turn and searching for my sister. She is not in the picture, although I certainly understand what happened to all of them. It is still a painful thing to think that she was having to go through this terrible time by herself. There are no words to explain the evil and the terror of the Holocaust. The genocide of six million Jews, of which 1.5 million of them were children. And one-sixth of all the Jews that died in the Holocaust died at Auschwitz. And that's the history lesson, and we're going to go on with our sermon, but that history lesson is a backdrop for our sermon today. And I want you to again look at Proverbs chapter 24, and look at these words. This is in the Bible. This is for you. This is for me. It says that we as believers in God and Christians, we are to rescue those that are being led away to death. We are to hold back those who are staggering towards slaughter. That's verse 11. Now that word rescue, and I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Uh, in, the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, the word for rescue is the word natsal. And the Hebrew word for hold back is the word kasak. So two Hebrew words, natsal and kasak. And these two words, rescue, rescue those that are being led away to death, this word, natsal, is a, a picture if someone was a friend of yours was in a river white water rafting and they were the river was fast flowing and they were going to drown and you were standing on the shore and you looked and here came your friend about to die and at the last second you reached out and you saved you pulled that person from that river you would be rescuing that person the word uh kasak, and to hold back, a picture of that, uh, imagine your son or your daughter as a young boy, uh, as a child, and they were going, they were getting ready to run out into the middle of a very, very busy street, like the freeway or maybe uh, Rinaldi during rush hour, and you looked over and you saw your child getting ready, ready to run out into the street, and at the last second, you as a parent, as an adult, you ran over and you got in front of that child and you held them back from going out into the middle of the street. That's what these two words mean. And the Bible says that we are to rescue those that are being led away to death, and we are to hold back those that are staggering towards slaughter. Verse 12 tells us, if you say, and this, this is the whole sermon, I want you to get this. If we say, well, we, we didn't know anything about it. Or you say, we, we couldn't do anything about it. If you come up with some excuse, the Bible says, does not he, God, who weighs the heart, perceive that you're basically making an excuse? Does not he, God, who guards your life, not know what's going on? And then it says, will he, God, not repay each person according to what he has done? I have three points. I'm going to go over them quickly. Point number one. You and I cannot feign ignorance. We can't just make up excuses. Whenever you and I see people at risk, seeing people that are hurting, 
seeing people that are suffering injustice, especially when their lives are at stake, we cannot act as though we don't know anything about it. There have been many genocides throughout the years of time in Ireland, in Indonesia, Asia, Africa, uh, Armenia. But every day, every day, right now, 2020, all around us are injustices. People who are lost, people who are staggering towards slaughter, people who are in harm's way. And we in the church, this is you and me, just want you to know that we are to be filled with compassion. We are to be compelled to action, to help rescue, to help redeem, to help protect anyone and everyone who feels as though they're being led to the slaughter. And for, uh, for those of you who think, well, uh, who, who, who are we supposed to be helping? In case you're having a difficult time identifying people who need our help, let me give you some examples of people who need our help. First of all, we have the homeless situation where there are homeless people on almost every single corner of our city. And then we have those that are addicted to drugs and to alcohol and to pornography. And then we have those that are being affected by COVID-19, people who've lost their jobs, people that are having a hard time putting food on the table. Then we have children who are caught up in the foster care system. Then we have like a billion people, one billion people who go to bed hungry each and every day, children who literally die every single day of starvation. Not to mention those who are caught up into sex trafficking, which is going on all around the world today. Then we have babies that right now are being led to the slaughter in the abortion clinics that are, that's taking place right here in our nation and around the entire world. Then we have people that are suffering racial injustice uh, today and every day in our country. This is going on. And then, of course, there are millions of people, millions, and I would say billions of people that do not know Jesus. They are lost. They are lost. And without the Lord, they are headed to a place called destruction. And you and I should be rescuing them. We should be putting ourselves in the way of trying to hold them back from walking down some of these paths. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 31, right here, it says that you and I, you and I are supposed to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly and defend the rights of the poor and defend the rights of the needy. And then 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that if one part, if just one person suffers, the Bible says, then every part should suffer. The eyes of the church, the eyes of the church should be outwardly focused. That when one person suffers, we should be moved with compassion to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And now, more than ever, we have thousands of excuses on why we can't help people. Like, who am I? And what can I do? And I, I've got my own problems. And who am I to help? And I, I don't have the time. And I don't have the resources. And I, I don't have the know-how. And I don't, I don't know if I can make a difference. You need to remember that Proverbs chapter 24, verse 12 said that if you say we know nothing about this, does not God who weighs the heart and perceives the heart, will he not repay us according to what we've done or not done? In other words, I just want you to know this, ladies and gentlemen, don't be mad at me. It's, it, it is useless to make excuses to God because God has heard every excuse in the book. We cannot, as Christians, feign ignorance when we look at the world and all the people who are suffering today. You cannot look the other way. Which leads me to my second point, that you and I should love people the way God loved you. You and I should be loving others the way that God has shown love towards you. If God, has ever, if God ever rescued you, and how many of you would give testimony that somewhere in your life, somewhere in your past, God has rescued you. He rescued you at some point in your life. Raise your hand right now. Raise your hand if God has rescued you at some point. And if God has ever rescued you, then you should be rescuing others. 
If God has ever helped you, how many, how many of you would say, yes, God has helped me? If God has ever helped you, you should be helping others. If God has ever comforted you, you should be comforting others. If God has ever saved you, you should be helping others be saved. If God has ever loved you, you should be loving others. If God has ever provided for you, then you should be helping provide for others. If God has ever forgiven you, then you should be forgiving others. If God has ever shown compassion to you, then you should be showing compassion to others. If God has ever bestowed mercy upon you, then you should be showing mercy to others. Does not the Bible say in Psalm chapter 68, verse 5, that God is a father to the fatherless? That if he is a God who comforts and protects and defends and provides and loves the least of these, then so shouldn't you and I be caring for the least of these? When I look at 1 John, I want you to look at this. 1 John chapter 3, it says, now this is in the Bible. This is in your Bible, New Testament. Let's hear it. This is how we know. What love is that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Oh, let's all thank the Lord. Come on. Jesus Christ laid down his life. Oh, thank you, Lord, for laying your life down for us. But the Bible says this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. He laid down his life for us. We ought to lay our lives down for others. If anyone has material possessions and he sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? And the Bible says, dear children, let us not love with just words and tongue, but let's love with actions and in what? Truth. Jesus told an amazing story in Luke chapter 10. Someone, it was a lawyer, who came up to ask Jesus a question. And the question that the man asked, he asked Jesus, Jesus, what does it take to inherit eternal life? That's a great question to ask Jesus. I mean, Jesus can answer the question about eternal life. If you have a question about eternal life, Jesus is the guy you want to ask. So this lawyer comes up to Jesus and he asks Jesus a question, Jesus, what is the secret? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus uh, didn't just answer the man's question. He answered the man's question with a question of his own. He answered a question with a question. The man says, what do I have to do to, to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to the man, you tell me when you read the scriptures, he said to the lawyer, when you, you're a smart guy, when you read the law, when you read the Bible, wh- wh- what do you think? How do you think a man inherits eternal life? And the man, the lawyer, had a good good response. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. The lawyer answered, well, I think that the Bible, you know, sometimes we think these are Jesus' words, and they are, but the lawyer somehow picked up on this, and he answers Jesus' question. The lawyer said, well, I think that the eternal life is all wrapped up to, he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind, number one. And number two is to love your neighbor as yourself. And all Jesus said was, correct. You answered correctly. And he began to walk away. And the lawyer said, but I have a, I have a second question. And Jesus said, okay, what's your second question? Which is my third point. The third point is, who is my neighbor? I want you to think about this now. They're having a discussion about eternal life. Now stay with me on this. Jesus and this lawyer are having a discussion about eternal life. And the lawyer wants to know, what is eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you you tell me. And the man says, to to love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, your strength, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, correct. And then the man said, well, who is my neighbor? In other words, I I, I understand the loving God part. And and you and I, we're all, we understand we got to love God. You're not going to get to heaven if you don't love God. All right, all right. I love God. He said, but Jesus said, To love God. The Bible says to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the lawyer wants to know, well, who is my neighbor? It's a good question. You need to know who Jesus is talking about, what the Bible is talking about when it says that you also have to love your neighbor. Jesus answers this question about the neighbor by telling a story. Now, you're very familiar with this story. But as I answer and I read through this story... 
I want you to remember that all of this began with a question about eternal life, and eternal life is found when you love God and when you love your neighbor as yourself. This story is in response to a question about eternal life. And who is it exactly that we're supposed to love? So I want you, I want you to go back and look at Luke chapter 10. I wanna go through this as quickly as I can. Jesus said in response to who is my neighbor, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell among the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and they went away and they left this man half dead. He's laying there on the side of the road. The Bible says that a priest, and a priest is a religious man. A priest is someone who goes to the synagogue. He's involved in the things of God, he's a holy man. Happened to be going down the exact same road and when he saw the man that was laying there half dead, the Bible says that he passed by on the other side. The next verse says that so to a Levite, that's another religious man. This is the second religious man. He too serves on behalf of God. He works for God. He's a religious person. He's a godly person. But when he came to the place and saw the man that was half dead, the Bible says that the Levite passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, and who are the Samaritans? These are the people that were an outcast. These are the people that were always uh, suffering racial discrimination. Nobody liked the Samaritans. He wasn't a religious person like the priest and the Levite. The Bible says that a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came where the man was. And when he saw the man, the Bible says that he took pity on him. And he went to him and he bandaged up his wounds and pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man that was half dead on his own donkey and he took him to an inn and he took care of them. And the next verse says that the next day he took out two silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper and he said to the innkeeper, look after him. He said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And so the question is, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? We're to love God and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. We understand who God is, but who is my neighbor? Who is Jesus talking about? Jesus is saying that your neighbor is the one who's been robbed. Your neighbor is the one who's been left for dead. Your neighbor is the one who is hurting and in need. Your neighbor is the one that the religious people didn't want to have anything to do with, didn't want to help. Your neighbor is the one who's been cast aside. Jesus is saying your neighbor is the one that has been shoved aside Jesus is saying that your neighbor is the one that is on the low rung of society. Do you want to know who, qualify, who qualifies to be your neighbor? Write this down. The one who's most vulnerable. That's who your neighbor is. It's not that guy next to you that you just love and is a perfect neighbor. No, Jesus is saying the most vulnerable is your neighbor. The widow, the lost, the destitute the homeless, the foreigner, the outcast, the downtrodden, the addicted, the brokenhearted, the diseased, the forsaken, the orphan, the enslaved, the sick, the poor, the imprisoned, the weak, the refugee, the disenfranchised. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 15, suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and they don't have any food. And if one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, Jesus said, the Bible says, what good is that? And then the Bible says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, it is what? It is dead. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, with all of us right now, you and I are the church. And right now we're having church in our homes. We're not meeting in the building. We're meeting in your home. 
And we're like the salt has left the salt shaker. And you, in your home, and all the other members of this church, we are sprinkled in every neighborhood in the city of Los Angeles. We're in every community, we're in every block, we're in every area of this city right now. And I wanna encourage those of you in your household to look around for people who are the least of these, who are the most vulnerable, and spend your day, spend your day loving God, and spend your day loving the least of these, those that are most vulnerable. I wanna tell you about a man named Franz Stengel. Here's a photo of him. Uh, he oversaw large concentration camps. He started off euthanizing uh, mentally and physically handicapped people. And they eventually, the Nazi party moved him in charge of some of the death camps. And it is estimated that this man himself was responsible for the killing of one million people during the Holocaust. After the war was over, he escaped somehow, and uh, in 1967, he was uh, captured. In 1967, he was in Brazil, got captured. And uh, I was nine years old at the time. I want you to know that this happened in my lifetime. This is not something that happened two or three or 400 years ago. This is in my lifetime. He killed one million Jews living down in Brazil. He gets captured in 1967. He was extradited to West Berlin, and he was tried, put on trial for the mass murder of 900,000 Jews. And he was, 1970, he was found guilty, and he was sentenced to life in prison, where he served for six months when he died of a heart attack in prison. During his imprisonment, while he was in there for six months, he agreed to do a series of interviews. And there was a famous journalist back there, her name was, back then her name was Gita Serini. And one of her questions when she was interviewing this man was whether or not he believed that Jewish people were human beings. That was her question. He replied, by telling a story when he was down in Brazil years later after the war, he said he was on a train and he was traveling down these railroad tracks and the train stopped and he looked out his window and as he looked out the window, it was right in front of a slaughterhouse full of cattle. And when the cows heard the train and that stopped, he said all of those cows came out of the slaughterhouse, they came right over to the fence, right up next to the train. And he says, as I looked out the window, he said, all I could see, it was just all crowded with cows and they were all just staring at me. And he goes, when I saw those, those cows looking at me, he said, my mind went back to Poland. And he said, that's the same look that the people used to give me. And the journalist followed up by asking a question. She said, she stayed on target. She said, so you didn't feel that the Jews were human beings? And he answered, cargo. He said, I just saw him as cargo. And doesn't that make you sick to your stomach? It should. Oh, listen, I know, listen, I know you're all worried about COVID-19 and you're all huddled up in your house and you're all worried about COVID-19. I'm looking at a period of time not too long ago where six million Jews died in the Holocaust. That is about six million times worse than what you're going through right now. I just want you to know that when you see a homeless person and, you, and, 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 I, and I'm like you, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. How many of you know I'm preaching to myself today? You drive around LA, everywhere you go, you find homeless people. But the next time you see a homeless person, I don't want you to see them as a homeless person. I want you to look at them and realize that that homeless person is a human being created in the image of God. And the next time you see an addict or a junkie, don't see them as an addict or a junkie. I want you to see them as a human being created in the image of God. 
And the next time you hear of an abortion taking place, I want you to know that that child being aborted is a human being created in the image of God. And the next time you hear of someone suffering racial injustice, I want you to realize that that person is a human being created in the image of God. And the next time you see or meet an illegal immigrant, I want want you to understand that that illegal immigrant is a human being created in the image of God. And the next time you drive by a, a nursing home and you look inside that nursing home and you see the elderly people that are in there, some of them have lost their minds. I want you to know that that elderly person is a human being created in the image of God. And the next time you hear of someone breaking the law and having to go to prison, I want you to look at that prisoner and realize that that prisoner is a human being created in the image of God. And the next time you find or hear of a child that's been caught up into the foster care program or someone who's been caught up in sex trafficking, I want you to know that that person is a human being created in the image of God. And the next time you see someone jogging down the street or maybe wearing a hoodie, I want you to realize that that jogger or that person wearing a hoodie is a human being created in the image of God. Can someone say amen? That's why I miss meeting together. Because I know you would all be clapping right now. As I close, I want to go back to the train photos. Thousands and thousands and thousands, millions and millions and millions, six million Jews. One sixth of all the Jews that died in the Holocaust were killed at Auschwitz. And they all got there by a train. And true story, all over Germany, all over Germany, all over Germany were churches, Christian churches, people meeting in church, conducting services on Sunday mornings. And there were railroad tracks. See that railroad track? There were railroad tracks all over Europe carrying Jews to the slaughter. And there were actually Christians meeting inside the church on Sunday morning, and they would be singing. And right behind their church was the railroad tracks with the railroad cars taking Jews to the death camps. And while they were in church, they could hear the train going by. And people knew what was going on, but many of them were not involved. They were afraid or they just didn't care. And we've heard story after story how people were in church and when they would hear the train coming knowing what was happening, that in church they would just start singing louder so they wouldn't have to hear the train going by the church. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that right now, right now, while you're sitting in your house and everybody's talking about COVID-19, 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 I want you to know that there are literally billions of people around this globe that are lost and they're on a, they're on a path that leads to destruction because of sin, because of disobedience, because of evil, because they've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And what do we do? We wanna sit in the church and just sing louder and we act like none of this stuff's happening in the world. And I believe that this is the day that God has called you and the day that God has called me to get more involved in what's happening in our world and the many areas where people are going astray. I conclude with these words. We've gotta, we cannot feign ignorance. We need to start loving people the way uh, God loves us and we need to especially love those that are most vulnerable, can someone say amen? Because that's who we were. Romans 5, 8, look at these words, that God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, you and I were lost, 
You and I were in the process of sinning. You and I are committing sins. It doesn't say that if we repented, it says that while we were sinning, that Christ loved us so much that he went to the cross and he died so that you and I could have everlasting life. He died for us so that our sins could be forgiven. He reached down to us. We were the most vulnerable and God loved us. And so we should love others. I'm just simply asking you to take all the love and all the grace and all the mercy and all the forgiveness that God has ever shown upon you when you were at your most vulnerable state and that you would take that and share that with as many people that you possibly can. And if you'll be motivated to start seeing people as human beings created in the image of God with an eternal destiny, knowing that they need Jesus Christ, and you will love those people with the love of God, and you become the hands of the feet of Jesus Christ, then all of us being sheltered in our homes all over the city will be the best thing that ever happened to us. Because God got us out of this building, and he got us out into that city where we're to help and serve and love and cherish the least of these. Let's pray. Father God, I pray, if there's anybody listening who's not a Christian, oh, help them to text Jesus to the number that's on their screen. God, I pray that you would touch every heart. I know this, I know, I know this sermon is a little heavy, I get that. But Lord, I think sometimes we need to wake up and we need to be reminded of what's going on in this world. We get so caught up in all the worries of this life that we do not see the eternal destiny. And we do not understand those who are truly hurting. Because so often we see only our own pain. We don't see the pain of others. So often we're so self-centered in the fact that we just want to we want to get over our little problems and our little worries and not realize that there are millions of people all around us who are hurting, who are desperate, who are lonely. Lord, I just pray today that you would bless each and every person, that they would understand the intent of this message. I pray that it would touch people's hearts. I pray as we go back and just think about that verse that we're to rescue those. We're to rescue people. We're to be involved in reaching out and rescuing people and loving people the way, God, you loved us. Thank you for loving us while we were yet sinners. Thank you for demonstrating your love to us. And now I pray that you would help us this week, God, to demonstrate that love to others. I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you, and thank you for being here today. I'll see you next weekend. I love you.